today uh, we, we have Theodore Summers and Mark Ho from Princeton University. And then we talk about learning rewards from natural language. So Theodore Summers is a third year PhD student advised by Tom Griffith. And um, his research uses reinforcement learning and decision theory to study human communication. He is interested in explaining how societies accumulate information over generations, and he hopes to develop an artificial system capable of interacting with and learning from humans. Before doing the PhD, uh, um, Theodore was a um, data scientist and an engineer um, at Automatic Labs and Uber. And um, Mark Ho is currently a postdoctoral researcher in the computer science and psychology departments of Princeton University and uh, try to combine ideas that, and methods that come from psychology, neuroscience and computer science and to identify design principles for interactive machine learning. Uh, he also developed better models of human decision making and is interested in the interaction aspect um, and uh, try to incorporate social cognition and understand computational principles that underline uh, the process of human planning in general. He received a PhD in cognitive science and a master in, in computer science from Brown University, and as well as a philosophy um, bachelor from Princeton. So I will now give the floor to them and thanks everyone for being here today. Awesome. Well, thank you for the intro, Sylvia, and thank you uh, to our hosts. Um, and of course, thanks to everyone attending in general. Um, so let me say, um, I absolutely would love questions at any point. So please feel free to just uh, shout out. It's a little hard for us to see the chat, but um, please just feel free to speak up and, and we're happy to take questions as, as we go. Um, so the focus of our talk today is going to be on this paper, uh, Learning Rewards from Linguistic Feedback, which is uh, was published in AAAI this past year, um, and it was a collaborative effort with me and Mark, as well as a bunch of other folks from, uh, from Princeton. So, um, you know, the basic question that we address here um, is learning from people. And so I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about why learning from people is, is sort of a, a valid objective to start. So uh, recent advances in deep reinforcement learning have shown that you can take you know, your favorite deep RL algorithm, so in this case, a deep Q network, um, and hook it up to a variety of complex environments, and it'll actually learn from direct experience what actions are sort of rewarding in, in the world. And so, you know, in this case, the DQN learns to play the Atari game Frostbite. Um, but in this 2017 paper, Lake and others pointed out that this isn't really human-like learning. You know, this actually, this curve looks impressive um, until you realize that this actually represents about two weeks of continuous play, whereas your average person can sort of step in off the street um, and bringing all of their sort of prior knowledge to bear and understanding of environment dynamics, they achieve a much higher score within minutes. Um, and so the first major reason that we'd wanna learn from people is really around sample efficiency, to essentially inject the sort of structured world knowledge into our agents rather than having them learn from scratch, arguably in the same way that you know, people learn socially rather than from direct experience. So the second, I think, major motivating reason um, is really around value alignment. So in addition to developing competent agents, we'd like those agents to actually do the things that are aligned with our desires. And so um, I think particularly for things like value alignment, you know, you can't actually learn from direct experience what a person wants you to do. You actually truly need social learning um, in, order to, in order to do that. And so that's, that's the sort of general aim of value alignment. And that's actually sort of what we talk about a lot in our work. But I think both of these are, are sort of valid reasons um, to learn from people. Awesome. So having established the desire to, we can then ask how you might go about learning from people. So the first sort of broad class of approaches learns from non-linguistic input. Um, and you can think of these as there's a, there's a lot of different varieties, but I think it's helpful to sort of break them down into two big approaches. One big approach essentially substitutes the person for the environmental reward signal. And so here um, you essentially allow the person to reward or punish an agent based on their behaviors. And reinforcement learning can essentially work directly from that signal. Um, on the other hand, you might allow the human to take some behavior in the world, so either to provide a demonstration, or you might give them a set of possible behaviors and have the person express a preference over which one they want. Um, and then you can use that signal to do inverse reinforcement learning to recover the human's reward function. 
Um, so those are sort of the two broad approaches in, in non-linguistic learning uh, uh, from people. Um, of course, in today's talk, we're interested in, uh, whoops, uh, we're interested in, in language input. And so I think it's worth noting the sort of easiest and, and most obvious way to express your desires to an agent is literally just to tell the agent what you want them to do concretely. And so this is the general form of instruction following where you typically issue sort of very concrete statements that ground to specific states or actions in an MDP and the agent learns to execute those behaviors. Um, and so the focus of today's talk is really to ask about these sort of other forms of language that might be out there. You know, obviously humans in our communication use way more than in just instructions. Um, you know, we, we use language to teach moral norms to small children. We use language to express our preferences when we're communicating with other adults, when we're negotiating. Um, we use language in more structured ways to sort of teach children about facts about the world. And so this observation that most teaching in robotics comes from instructions, and yet, you know, clearly I am not giving you a set of instructions in order to communicate about our work. Um, that really motivates this sort of broader research objective of learning about the world from these sort of naturalistic forms of language, whether it's preferences, advice, evaluation, however humans choose to express themselves is probably actually the best learning signal that we can get. Um, and so the idea here is to sort of meet people where they are in terms of how they want to express themselves. Um, and so just to sort of contrast that with these existing approaches, there's a really influential and cool paper by uh, Cristiano and others in 2017. Um, deep reinforcement learning from human preferences. And so the basic paradigm there is you have a set of humans um, and you give them you know, a little clip art robot um, and the agent is gonna take some sequence of actions. So they'll execute a trajectory. And then the humans express a preference over those trajectories. So they get two examples and they say, this behavior is better. Um, and this you know, actually works quite well. It's, it's a very cool paradigm and they do a great job with it. Um, but viewed from our perspective, you know, the thing that I thought was most interesting about this paper is the fact that these humans are actually contractors. And so the contractors didn't actually know how to do these tasks ahead of time, and so they had to be taught. So in the paper, in the appendix, there's actually a section that says how they taught the contractors to do the task. And it's kind of fascinating because it's literally language that describes how Atari works. So I think if you zoom out a little bit and kind of ask yourself what's really happening here, um, what we actually have are a set of researchers using language to teach another set of humans, and then the humans are expected to use preferences to teach agents. And so looking at this, you know, I think a sort of maybe a more natural or, or a more interesting way to try to do this um, is instead to parameterize the human's preferences. So basically experimentally manipulate what they want in the world, and then allow them to express those desires with language to agents. So that's the sort of approach that we take here. You know, if, if, it's, if it's intuitive for humans to communicate using language with other humans, really we'd like to design a robot that can understand that kind of language. Cool. Any questions about the high level approach or context before I dive into formalities? Awesome. All right. Um, so really quickly, we're working with standard markup decision processes. I assume this is generally familiar to folks. We have a set of states and actions. Um, and then really what we're gonna be focused on is the reward function uh, R. So um, the agents will execute trajectories, which we denote with tau. So that's just a sequence of states and actions in the world. Um, and then we describe those states and actions with features. So for simplicity here, we're just using a binary indicator variable that says whether or not a particular uh, state action tuple has a particular feature. Um, and then we assume that rewards are linear over those features. So that means that this, this W term here is actually a vector, uh, a reward vector that lives in um, feature space. And that defines the teacher's preferences over different features. Um, and I'll get, I'll sort of give you a concrete example of that in a minute. But I think the important dynamic here is um, the agent is gonna behave. So they're gonna execute a trajectory conditioned on their beliefs about the reward function at a given point in time. So basically the robot's gonna go do something in the world. Um, then the human is going to produce some piece of natural language feedback, so an utterance U, conditioned on whatever the robot just did. Um, and then what we're really interested in in this paper is this update step. So if I'm a robot and I go do something in the world and a human produces a piece of language, how should I update my beliefs about that person's general latent preferences, their reward vector W? Um, and so that's really the focus of, of this work, is asking how we can understand language in context of some behavior um, in order to get a pic better picture of a human's reward function. 
Cool. So just to make this really concrete, this is actually a screenshot of the task that we used. Um, and so we have a we have an agent essentially in a grid world, and there's a bunch of different shapes and colors. And so um, trajectories consist of collecting some set of shapes and colors. Um, and so maybe this robot has the belief that pink triangles are great, so they go out and they collect some some pink triangles. Um, and then we'll have a human teacher who's going to produce an utterance. They're going to say, you know, pink is good, but go for the squares next time. And the question is, how should the agent then adjust its beliefs about the reward function conditioned on what it just did and the feedback that it received? So um, the method that we introduced to do that, um, oh yeah, so just graphically, so what the, the really, the central question here is given this utterance, how do we map back to the teacher's latent reward function? Um, and the basic approach that we use is aspect-based sentiment analysis. So um, quick review of sentiment analysis. So it's frequently used for things like movie reviews or restaurant reviews out in the real world. And so you might get a piece of language like, you know, Top Gun Maverick was terrible. And so that grounds to a particular entity, right? It's expressing what we would say is negative sentiment about the movie as a whole. Um, and that's useful in many contexts, but you can imagine that I might leave a more nuanced review. So I might instead say something like, well, the plot was terrible, but the action sequences were great. And so instead of grounding to sort of the entity as a whole, these are actually two sort of separate aspects or, or features of the movie, which I'm describing independently. And so that's the basic idea here, is we want to take an utterance and we want to ground it to, we want to take the sentiment in it and sort of project it appropriately to different um, elements of the reward vector W, because some of them the teacher's going to like and some of them the teacher's not going to like. Um, cool. So I'm going to now walk through our sort of more detailed methodology for doing that. Um, so the first thing that we do is just extract the sentiment from an utterance. So if the teacher says, you know, that was great or that was bad, we're going to get a positive or a negative scalar value out of the piece of text. And there's tons of off-the-shelf tools to do this. There's BERT models. There's like going way back. There's tons of ways to do this. This is not really a, a novel challenge. The interesting part of our approach and the really challenging part is understanding how to ground that sentiment into different aspects of the MDP. So in addition to the scalar value, we really want a vector in MDP feature space that tells us which features that sentiment applies to. So if I say, say something like, you know, blue shapes are great, I want to know that that reflects a positive sentiment about the blue feature and not about any other features. So our general approach to do that is to first ask what element of the MDP the language relates to. And so just intuitively, um, if the person is providing information about the task, really any kind of information about the task, the language has to relate to some element of the MDP or else it's literally not task relevant. Um, and so we can start to reason about the sort of set of things that the person could be referring to when they express um, positive or negative sentiment. So um, the first thing that they might be talking about is the agent's prior behavior directly. So in the example that I gave, you know, that was good or that was bad, the language relates to the trajectory that the agent just executed. Um, on the other hand, they might say something like, you know, they might say, I would have rather you had done some other thing. So, um, you know, you should have gone over to that corner or done some other behavior. And so this language grounds to some set of states and actions in the real world that's not necessarily what the agent just did, some arbitrary set of states and actions. Um, and then finally, they might express a preference about a feature directly. So, you know, you might say, you know, I really liked the action in that movie, or you might say something like in the reinforcement learning task, you know, you might say something like, I really like blue shapes. And so that, again, grounds directly to a single feature in the MDP. Um, and so once we sort of understand what the person is talking about, and the way that we implement this is with just a classifier that grounds the language into one of these broader entities, the next thing that we need to do is project from that entity into the MDP feature space. And the good news is that step's actually pretty straightforward. So if the person refers to the trajectory and they, they say that was good, um, we can project that into the MDP feature space by just summing over the states and actions that the, that the uh, that constitute the trajectory. Um, similarly, if they refer to you know a other behavior that isn't what the agent did, we can sum over those features. And again, we now have a vector in feature space. Um, and then finally, uh, if they're talking directly about the features of the MDP, that's already grounded to the features, and so we don't actually need to do any additional legwork whatsoever. Um, so I'm just going to note really quickly, uh, we call these different forms of feedback evaluative. So if you're referring to the agent's prior behavior, um, imperative, if you're designating a set of states and actions um, that aren't what the robot did, so that's the general form of like an instruction, basically. Um, and then finally, descriptive, if you're talking directly about the, uh, 
the features of the MDP. And these actually are very similar to forms of feedback that show up in the educational literature, which is kind of cool. Um, so if, if you're interested in, in sort of uh, more of the human element, um, there's, some really, there's some really great work on that, which I think is, is kind of informative um, in this context. Cool, okay. So all of that being said, uh, once we've sort of run this, this algorithm, figured out, okay, how can we project this, this utterance into the MDP feature space? We're now at a point where we have a scalar sentiment and a set of MDP features that that sentiment applies to. And so the question is, how can we infer the latent reward function given those two pieces of information? Um, and fortunately, the answer is actually quite straightforward. Um, we just use Bayesian linear regression. Um, and so the way that you can think about this is that we're going to explain the sentiment. So maybe they said something, you know, they said that was great. We're going to explain their positive feeling about those MDP features um, by doing a regression um, on the actual feature counts. Um, and so we can explain the, the observed sentiment via some latent set of, of, uh, of weights on those features. So just to sort of uh, walk through this graphically, um, you know, you can imagine in our environment, um, we have some set of shapes and colors. So these are our features. Um, and we're interested in understanding the teacher's preferences over those shapes and colors. So some latent um, reward vector W. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to extract the sentiment and then we're going to use that um, to, to explain these latent weights. So let's say the agent goes and executes a trajectory like this one. They go up to the top left and they collect a bunch of yellow shapes. And maybe the teacher produces language something like that was terrible. So intuitively, that's a piece of evaluative feedback. It describes the trajectory that the agent just took. Um, and so we're going to get a feature vector that basically loads onto the yellow features like this. And we're going to get a negative sentiment because that's an unhappy statement. Um, and then maybe the teacher continues and they say something like bottom right was better. So that now grounds to a different set of states and actions that the agent didn't take. Um, and we get a different feature vector that's now loaded heavily onto the pink and blue shapes, some other part of the MDP feature space. And we have some positive sentiment associated with that feature vector. Um, and then finally, they might say something like pink triangles are the best. And so that's an example of descriptive feedback, which grounds to one specific, a one hot feature vector in MDP space. Um, and that gives us a very positive sentiment. And so at that point, the question is, um, how can we use these latent weights to explain this observed pattern of sentiment over these MDP features? And this is where we use Bayesian linear regression. Um, and we would get something like this, where in general, it looks like the teacher doesn't like the yellow features. They probably really like the pink feature. Um, and then we're sort of unsure about the blue features because the positive valence um, over those features could also just be explained by the presence of the pink triangles. Um, does that make sense to anyone? Any questions? I want to just pause. Um, cool. OK. Um, great. OK. So the first thing that we did in this, in this paper is actually just sort of make sure that this general approach works with humans. Like, do we actually get these forms of language when two humans teach each other in this task? Um, and so this is just a, a little screen grab of um, the task itself. So the learner you know, can navigate this robot, and they see that they get some number of points for collecting some shapes. Um, and then this is an example of the teacher UI. So in addition to seeing the learner's trajectory, they actually see the underlying point values, and they are given this unconstrained chat, little chat box chat box where they can send any text that they want to the learner after the learner acts. Um, and so we can start to look at how people actually behave in this setting. So um, the basic experimental paradigm is the learner plays some level. The teacher provides some feedback in the form of natural language. Um, the learner plays the next level. Um, and this continues for a total of 10 rounds. And we ran 104 pairs through this, uh, through this paradigm. And then we parameterize the teacher's preferences. So basically, um, some teachers saw, you know, Pink squares are very valuable. Some teachers saw blue circles are very variable. And so this simulated sort of different, a distribution of preferences over um, the shapes and colors. Um, cool. So we do actually observe all of these different forms of feedback in our, in our corpus. So teachers would say something like, you know, keep it up excellent, which is a positive sentiment, uh, evaluative feedback, or not a good move, which is negative sentiment, also evaluative. You know, top left would have been better. Um, or talking directly about the, the um, features themselves. So I think the first really interesting insight here is that there's actually quite a bit of structure in terms of when people use different forms of language. So 
Um, in order to, to understand that, we can plot the kinds of feedback that we see over the course of the experiment. So on the x-axis, I'm showing the level number. And again, we had 10 levels in the experiment. Um, and then on the y-axis, I'm going to plot the fraction of utterances that contain a particular form of feedback, as well as the learner scores over the course of the experiment. So um, I think the first thing that, that really jumps out here um, is just kind of a sanity check, which is that the learner scores go up over the course of the experiments. So that's good. You know, humans are able to teach other humans. We certainly hope that that's the case. Um, but then the really interesting thing that jumps out is descriptive feedback starts out actually is the most common, most prevalent form of feedback. So people are talking a lot about the specific features. They're saying stuff like, you know, oh, the pink circles are good or the, the yellow squares are good. Um, and then it actually decreases over the course of the experiment, which makes sense because as the, after the learner has sort of acquired that information, you're not gonna keep repeating that to the, to the learner. Um, and instead what happens is people give a lot more evaluative feedback, typically praise. And so basically there's a, there's a dynamic that emerges where people are teaching using descriptive language. Um, and then the way that you can think about this is the learner's feature counts from their trajectory. So basically they're gonna go collect a bunch of objects. And so you can think about at the end of each trajectory, you have a vector that constitutes the features that they obtained, like what did they actually do? Um, and over the course of learning that feature vector gets closer and closer to the true reward vector. It becomes aligned with the true reward vector. And at that point, it's much easier to just praise the learner and basically say, great job, um, because you're just reinforcing essentially what they already know, which is those are the positive features. Um, and so you can think of this as sort of off policy feedback when the learner is bad. So when they're experiencing features that are not close to the sort of optimal policy, um, the teacher provides off policy feedback and is like, you should be going for the pink things or, or, or the blue things. Um, and then they switch to evaluative feedback, which is essentially on policy, saying, you know, yeah, you're doing the right thing. That's, that's great. Um, and so this is why earlier on I quipped that telling a robot to not do something is, is maybe inefficient. Um, but certainly it's something that we don't see very much in our data. Um, because you can imagine if a person goes and collects purple things, um, you know, you certainly could say purple things are bad, but it might be more efficient to say, um, you know, well, yellow things are actually the good thing. Because if all you say is purple things are bad, that creates a lot of ambiguity about what the good things actually are. Um, Cool. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is great. We have some sort of confirmation that people actually do this. Um, and so the next question is, uh, do these models actually work on this data? Like, can we actually recover humans reward functions from totally unconstrained language? So in the paper, we tested three separate models. Um, the literal sentiment based regression model that I described earlier, um, I won't go into the details, but I'm happy to talk about them if anybody uh, is interested. Um, we augmented that model with a bunch of uh, pragmatic biases, which are inspired by Gricean theories of essentially how people communicate, you know, what we sort of prioritize, what we say, what we leave unsaid, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, we sort of asked if all this machinery was really necessary. Um, and we trained a small inference network end to end on the uh, initial, on actually a pilot run of human data. So a previous experiment. Um, and this is just a really small 128 unit feed forward um, neural network and it takes the trajectory, so the, the agent's prior behavior, as well as um, the utterance, and it learns to directly predict the teacher's uh, reward function. Um, so then we went back and we compared them to people. So um, up on the right, this is the sort of normalized score for two humans playing together in our environment, in our, in our, um, in our data collect. And so the first thing that we did was we ran our agents on that human data. So take a sequence of, of human interactions, so the, the behavior of the learner and then the utterance that was produced, and basically replay that through an agent and have the agent simulate trajectories and see how, the, how well the agent does. Um, and so the results are actually quite interesting. Um, we can see the pragmatic learner does reasonably well, not as well as people in live interactions. Um, the literal model does worse, and then the inference network actually does does fairly poorly. Um, and that's in large part because the inference network is very high variance. So there's some teachers that use um, like more idiosyncratic, less, less standard phrasing. Um, and the inference network does actually very poorly on, on those teachers. So that's interesting. And we have a certain sort of impression of how well the models do based on that. Um, but of course, you know, the, the real gold standard would be live evaluation on people. So to pair the uh, our artificial learner agents with actual humans. So we went back and did that. Um, and what we find is actually kind of striking and, and interesting. So first of all, the, all the learner scores improved substantially. 
Um, and that's in large part because they're now getting tailored feedback to their current beliefs. So if the agent you know, mistakenly believes, forms the belief that triangles are really important, and they go and they execute a trajectory where they collect triangles, the human will actually respond to that specific belief rather than just sort of replaying some static data um, from, from, the, um, from an existing data set. And so we see that kind of sort of contextual interaction um, substantially improves basically across the board. Um, and then the other two things that I think are worth noting um, are that the pragmatic model actually does almost as well as people. Um, and then the inference network does about as well as the literal listener, uh, which is, which is kind of cool. So more than anything else, I think that this particular pattern of results really underscores how important it is to test on, on live people um, and not just use some offline canned interactions. Um, there's been some interesting work on this, I should say, around um, trying, to, trying to do this in, in a better way that sort of respects the knock-on effects um, of, of a misinterpretation of an utterance. But I think you know, live, live testing uh, sort of is and, and, and sort of should remain um, the gold standard for this kind of stuff. Um, cool. So, uh, oh yeah, so the last thing uh, on this experiment is we can actually look at the inference network and sort of see what, see what it's learned about different utterances. So going back to this example trajectory, we can take different pieces of language and play them through the inference network and see what it's learned. Um, so the first thing to note is that it actually learns to map evaluative feedback to the trajectory itself. So it knows that the agent collected um, a bunch of yellow shapes. And so if it gets positive sentiment feedback, um, it learns to map that to positive sentiment on the collected tokens. And if it gets negative sentiment, um, it learns to map that uh, to, the same, to the same set of, um, of features. And then we also see that it actually has learned a qualitatively different form of feedback, which is this descriptive language, um, where if it receives language that grounds directly to um, MDP features, it bypasses the trajectory and it grounds um, directly to those, to those features. So that's a nice proof of concept um, that the, the network can in fact learn totally end to end um, that different forms of language are used in different ways and sort of reflect either preferences that are contextual to the behavior or general preferences that are not in any way contextual um, to the trajectory that the agent uh, executed. Awesome. OK, so uh, just a sort of high level recap of this paper, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our sort of uh, more, more recent work. Um, so the, the main question that we asked is, how can we use unconstrained language to supervise reinforcement learning agents? Um, and we really took human interactions as a sort of normative basis. Um, that is the ideal interaction style that we want to be able to emulate in an artificial agent. Um, and so what we see is that descriptive language really plays this sort of central role in teaching. People want to communicate the abstract task relevant information. They don't just sort of say specific things that the agent should have done. Um, and we also introduce uh, two different methods to ground this kind of complex language. One being this aspect-based sentiment analysis, which is um, sort of more structured and amenable to these pragmatic augmentations. Um, as well as an end-to-end -end inference network um, that doesn't require any of this, this sort of prior structure or uh, assumptions about the environment. Um, cool. So uh, this is now our, our sort of most recent work building on this, on this general thread. So this actually, um, I put this preprint up last week, and I actually, I don't think I've tweeted about it yet. So this is hot off the presses. Um, it's under review at NeurIPS right now. Um, OK, so uh, the aim of this paper is to sort of go back um, and ask what kinds of language should a, teach, a speaker use to teach the learner. Um, and so in the previous paper, the learning rewards was really focused on the listener and saying, okay, how should the listener interpret unconstrained language? And we sort of developed this model of instructions and descriptions and like different, different forms of feedback. Um, and so now we're going from the speaker angle and asking, okay, well, when does it make sense to use one form of language over the other? And so in order to study this, um, we introduce a formal setting um, which is a contextual bandit setting. Um, and we then formalize these notions of instructions and descriptions um, and study two specific problems. First of all, what should a speaker say in different contexts? Like what, what is a generative model for the speaker? And then second, once we have that generative model, can we do pragmatics? So can we, can we take that utterance, invert the speaker model and recover additional information about the reward function? Um, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of a speed run through this. Um, but I'll say the details are, are in the paper on archive, um, and I'm also very happy to uh, very happy to answer questions or, or talk more about it in the discussion afterwards. But I want to make sure that we uh, do leave time for that. Um, okay, so this minimal model of social learn of social learning, um, we're again in a in a very simple linear reward setting. So 
for fun, we used um, mushrooms. So you can imagine uh, foraging from different patches of mushrooms, and you have a learner agent that doesn't know anything about what different mushroom features are worth. Um, but fortunately for them, we're going to introduce this notion of a cooperative speaker agent who actually has complete knowledge of the reward function and can produce some utterance um, before the learner takes an action. So um, the two questions, again, that we're going to study then are what should the speaker say and what can the listener infer from whatever the speaker's choice of utterance is. Um, okay, awesome. So in this, in this work, we build directly on the Rational Speech Act which uh, is a framework that basically suggests that speakers choose utterances to maximize some utility function. Um, and so the utility function that we introduce um, is actually directly grounded to the learner's policy. So we say that the utility of an utterance um, conditioned on some state, so the state is the you know, particular action context that the learner is facing, um, as well as the reward function W, um, is going to be um, a function of the probability of the learner choosing a particular action times the rewards associated with that action. So basically the speaker is trying to maximize the expected utility of the learner in this context. Um, now, intuitively in this like minimal setting here, you would wanna say something like take the spotted red mushroom because that's the best possible action that the learner could execute. Um, but language is interesting because we don't just use it to address the current context. We can also talk about sort of far off future settings. And so in order to model this, we introduced the notion of a horizon, which basically posits that in addition to some known context, the learner agent is going to behave in some unknown future contexts. And so the speaker can reason not just about the present utility of an utterance, but also the future utility of the utterance. Um, and so they do so by marginalizing over future states. Um, and this essentially represents the expected generalization um, of this utterance to future unknown contexts. Um, and so this then defines our speaker objective, which is just a linear combination of some present utility and some future utility. And we can refer to short horizon speakers as optimizing for the local context and long horizon speakers as optimizing for some unknown sort of future settings that the listener might find themselves in. Um, and this is nice because it formalizes speakers as reward designers. So the speaker is now essentially choosing an utterance to maximize the listener's rewards over some um, actually distribution of, of MVPs. Cool, okay, so I'm just sort of pushing that to the top here. Um, and then I'll really quickly introduce our formal model of instructions and descriptions. Um, so, you know, you might say something like take the spotted red one, uh, and then we can formalize this by um, describing its effects on the learner's policy. So we model a very simple learner. So the, the uh, instruction utterance grounds directly to an action. And the learner will take that action if it's available and they'll choose randomly otherwise. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to issue a description, um, building on sort of our earlier work around descriptive language, um, descriptions relate directly to one MD, to one feature in the, in, the, um, in the MDP. So you might say something like blue is negative two. Um, and then that's gonna affect the learner's policy by affecting their beliefs about the reward function. So under the assumption that the agent is going to choose uh, choose an action rationally with respect to their beliefs, changing their belief about the feature value will actually then ripple outwards and affect their policy. So one way to see this is that instructions ground directly to actions, whereas descriptions modify the learner's beliefs about the reward function, and then in turn um, modify their behaviors. So um, if we simulate our speaker model, we can see uh, when the speaker is considering short horizons, um, instructions make a lot of sense because they have a higher probability of getting you exactly the right action. Um, and then as the, speaker, as the speaker's horizon lengthens, that is as they consider more and more latent um, future states, they actually shift to start using descriptive language. And they even shift to using you know, either utterances that blend sort of local utility and future utility, like warning the person away from this like very toxic blue mushroom. Um, and then finally at long enough horizons, they start to produce highly generalizable information that's actually completely irrelevant to the current context, but serves decision-making um, in the future. And so this is really the emergence of, of teaching. Um, instead of instructing the agent to do something specific, you're now teaching them facts about the world that will allow them to behave sort of autonomously in, in unknown future contexts. Um, cool. So I won't go super into the details here, but if we plot the future rewards obtained by a learner um, based on uh, the speaker's horizon, um, what I'm showing here is just that as the speaker gets longer horizon, that is as they reason more about the future, 
they produce utterances that, that give higher future rewards, which makes sense. Basically, they become more of a teacher and less of an of a, um, instruction giver. Um, and then the interesting second question, um, so that's, that's sort of the first question, what should the speaker say? So then the second question is, what can the listener infer from this utterance above and beyond the sort of literal content of that utterance? Um, and so here again, building on the Rational Speech Act, uh, we basically have the learner embed a model of the speaker. And so they reason about what utterances the speaker would produce conditioned on different beliefs about, sorry, conditioned on different reward functions. Um, and then they invert that model in order to recover the reward function. Um, so again, I'm gonna gloss over the details, um, but basically what that lets us do um, is recover additional information about the reward function beyond just the speaker's utterance. Um, and then finally, I'll say, this can be a little tricky because if you assume that the teacher, for example, is behaving, um, if you assume that the teacher is behaving pedagogically, that is if you assume that they have a very long horizon and they're giving you very general information, um, this inference can actually go really poorly. And you can actually do way worse. Um, you can do way worse than just a literal interpretation of the utterance. Um, and so one of the main contributions in this paper um, is we show that you can jointly infer the speaker's um, latent horizon, that is whether or not they're trying to teach you or they're giving sort of direct instructions, um, as well as their reward function. And so this allows for a more conservative form of, of inference that doesn't have this sort of um, substantial failure mode um, and is also practical because in reality, we never know if the person is sort of considering just the local context versus considering the sort of uh, situation more, more globally. Cool. Um, so the key contributions here are this sort of formal model of social learning in a contextual bandit setting, um, uh, formalizing instructions as specifying an action and descriptions informing us about the reward function. Um, and then this model of speakers as reward designers, um, which gives us this unified generative model over different forms of utterances um, and allows us to define a pragmatic listener that performs inverse reward design to infer the speaker's latent reward function. Um, and then lastly, you know, we do sort of find that pragmatics are in fact tricky. Um, but that accounting for latent horizons allows us to um, uh, sort of sidestep this, this issue. Um, and then in the NeurIPS paper, um, there's a lot of other stuff. So uh, we have some interesting proofs. And then um, we actually run a behavioral experiment and have people produce utterances um, for speakers that are foraging from one patch or many patches. Um, and we show that they do in fact follow our model's predictions and that our pragmatic listener can actually recover their reward functions. Cool. That's uh, that's everything that I had prepared. So I think Mark and I would love to take any questions. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Do we have any question from you guys? Uh, there are a lot of people clapping hands. Uh, please like raise your hand if you have questions as well. Okay, there is one. Please, Daniel, go ahead. Uh, thanks. This is super cool work. And um, I, I think the idea of like inferring the horizon that, that the person who's giving the instructions has is awesome. Um, I was wondering, like, um, are you so there's this kind of like this distribution over latent states. And is that um, like, is that kind of primed by the current state in some way? Like, um, cause as the horizon gets longer, like the behavior is kind of, you know, becoming farther and farther away from the state that you're currently in, which, which yeah. seemed interesting. Yeah, totally. So thank you. Great question. Big fan of your work as well. Um, um, so we basically sidestep that issue, honestly, in our work, because we use a contextual bandit setting. And so the future states are assumed to be drawn from some you know, IID distribution. There's no relation between the mushroom patch that you're in now and the mushroom patch that you're gonna encounter in the future. Um, um, I think a, a, maybe a more satisfying answer, well, let me say actually, first of all, even in, even in that setting, the speaker's assumed distribution over future states is also actually really important. And so you can imagine if I thought that one kind of mushroom was more common than others, or if there was a very rare poisonous mushroom, that's actually going to really affect my which utterances I prioritize at longer horizons. Um, and so that's something that I'm really excited about looking into. You know, you should be able to get their latent horizon, some distribution over which mushrooms are common, like all of that. You should be able to get something like that. Um, but it, it definitely gets trickier. Um, 
And then, yeah, in terms of sequential dependence, when you're actually talking about a trajectory, um, I do not have a great, uh, a great answer for that. I will say there's some interesting work around, um, uh, oh man, who did this? Uh, it's in Nature Human Behavior, and it shows that people, children teach using expected utility. I think this might've been Julia Jarrett Ediger and some other people. Speaking of Sophie Bridges. Sophie, yeah, it's a British yeah, paper, Sophie thank Bridges, you. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, oh, Blonde. you're right. Blonde. Yeah. Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, and so they show that teacher that, that uh, um, when children are teaching other children about how to use toys, they actually account for things like exploration costs. So if there's some particular button combination that activates a toy, even if it's not a super rewarding toy, they'll teach that one because they know the person's not going to discover it by themselves. So I do think that kind of sequential dependence definitely exists and is out there. Um, but, but we unfortunately didn't deal with it in, in, in this paper. That's super cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we, we, we haven't dealt with it in the work that we've done either, but I, it sounds exciting to, you know, like the pedagogical setting, like figure out what the person knows and, and how to build on it. Be super yeah. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like some combination of like IRL to be like, well, you know, condition on this, this is what they probably think, and then the optimal adjustment to that. Totally, totally. Mark, I, I'm going to put in a plug for some of Mark's work. Mark has a really interesting recent paper um, in Nature around task constraints, which gives you the rep, the, it basically gives you an optimal representation of a task for, for a person, like how should they represent that task. Um, and so I think there might be something that you could do socially there where it's like, well, you know, what is their likely task, like invert their world model, uh, invert their behavior to get their world model and think about how you should update their world model. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of that work is kind of inspired by these ideas around like resource rationality. And I think kind of scaling up a lot of these things in pragmatics and stuff are gonna kind of require doing this kind of, taking yeah. into account the computational cost of actually doing like complicated inference and stuff. So yeah, um, yeah. Have we talked about communication as resource fashion? I should think about that. You're probably calling me. Do we have other questions from the uh, audience? Mm. If there are no, I will ask. I have some. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a follow up uh, with respect to what Daniel was saying. Uh, um, that uh, re regarding the task horizon, if you are also like uh, considering uh, the um, how, how um, knowledgeable is the, the speaker in that context, right? Because I guess like someone that knows less about the task would, would uh, use a different type of uh, explanation. And as well, like if there is some uh, in the experiment that you have done, if you have observed that if people uh, compare different possibilities because in the type of uh, feedbacks that you put like instruction and description there is no reference to like comparison or counterfactuals while in in the literature like there is a lot of like regarding the fact that people give counterfactuals but have you observed that and have you accounted for that somehow yeah that's a great question um so so learning rewards from linguistic feedback was a was a um, was a post hoc thing. So the, the the agent would behave, and then the learner could give feedback. Um, and so that I think was a we did see counterfactuals there for sure. You know, language like you know the bottom right corner is better, things like that. Those are all definitely that form of language. Um, the challenge with that setting is that it wasn't really natural for instructions. So if you notice, I didn't really talk at all about imperative language because honestly, people didn't use it very much because honestly, it wasn't very useful. Um, and so in order to give instructions their sort of full, you know, treatment in a, in a really proper way, we made for um, this more recent paper, we made it forward facing. And so in that context, you know, I think an instruction is more useful than there, there's not really the notion of a counterfactual. Um, and then unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, we also decided to simplify the sort of sequential interaction thing. So we had specifically we had um, participants talk to like a new individual in each round. So a new person comes in, they're going to go foraging. What would you say? A new person comes in, they're going to go foraging. What would you say? Um, and that that is nice. It's, it's it's an important. It's the essential first step, really. Um, but it also I think removes the ability to to sort of give post hoc feedback in the anticipation of future behavior, things like that. But these are all great questions. 
Um, and I agree, counterfactuals definitely do have an important or explanations, you know, obviously you, you know that. Um, explanations, you know, things, things like that are, 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 are definitely important. Yeah, I think I there are, I would say the, the maybe just the, the philosophy of this most recent paper was really trying to find a, a the minimal formal setting that allowed mm. for useful theoretical properties, like theoretical analysis, and then some grounding into human behavior to make sure that we're still like generally useful. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of, of, of things to do and, and ways to build on it. Yeah. Okay, I have many other questions, but I will uh, ask uh, others if they have as well. And then I think we should start wrap, wrap up. So if you have a question, it's the time to go before we close the session. Any other question? No? Let me say also, um, I'll, I'll definitely hop on the Slack channel and I'm, I'm like slowly warming up to the idea of using Twitter. Um, very, slowly, very slowly, but if you want to ping me there, I will do my best to respond. Um, yes, so we create a um, specific uh, channel for you so that uh, people, if they have questions, they can ask uh, there. Too. Perfect. Um, okay. No, awesome. no other question? I will uh, then ask a very short one, uh, if no one has. Um, have you tried to um, make the agent generate those type of instruction and descriptions for humans to learn something? No. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, th I thought about doing that. Um, with the original paper, but I wasn't really uh, up to speed on the most recent stuff around language modeling. So I think um, when I thought about it, I was like, oh, well, I would just basically do like a classic linguistics, like retrieve the best utterance from the existing stock that we have or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, um, I did write a generative model that did that. Um, it was kind of cool. It, it gave good advice, like pretty reasonable rankings of stuff. Um, but yeah, I would be super curious to kind of throw all this into some nice uh, larger, larger language model or, or VLM and kind of see what it spits out these days. Um, I'm actually, so I, I'm actually uh, now interning um, uh, at DeepMind. And so we're, I'm, I'm specifically looking at generative language in, in more complex environments, um, kind of doing an end run around the theory and just looking at what we get from large scale web purposes. Um, yeah. That's cool, super cool. So I will uh, thank you once again for, for the presentation for this session. And uh, we'll share my screen again for uh, introducing the next session before we leave. Can you see my screen? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Just before we go off, I want to say thanks to everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. And we'll definitely see you on the Slack uh, and hopefully in future sessions. Yes, a lot of other people claps and hands, Daniel claps the hands. So our uh, next session uh, will be uh, on the 6th of July, and we will have Anastasia Ostrowski from MIT Media Lab uh, Personal Robots uh, Group. And she will talk about equitable co-design of robots. So um, looking forward to, to seeing you there. And uh, thanks once again to our sponsor for supporting us. And uh, see you in two weeks.